a man after God's own heart. Sure, he was flawed in some ways. Who's not? Amen. We all flawed in some ways. I, you know, that's one thing I hate about the internet. The internet makes us amplify, amplify people's amplify people's flaws and just have whole conversations about what folks get wrong. You know, that's a curse on people. For you to put yourself in a position to just talk about what people are dealing with and not talk about what you are dealing with. A whole, look at somebody and say, who are you? Why is something always wrong with everyone else? I guarantee you something is wrong with you if you think that way. Amen. All right. Remember that song by the William Brothers, Sweep Around Your Own. Uh, you know, this little section over here, they just be waiting on the song cues. This the jukebox section. They just be waiting on the song cues. I said jukebox, and these kids like, what is that? But the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. Yep, David was flawed. You know, some folks wouldn't even read Psalms nowadays after what David got into. He got into some stuff. We would just disqualify him. Oh, God can't use him for the stuff he, he did. That's how judgmental people are. And you reading the Bible? You know, God going to tell the story. But he was flawed in some ways. He may have even suffered from an inferiority complex at times being so different from his brother. So always being considered low, small, young, whatever. Because even when Samuel came in uh, uh, and went to Jesse to anoint one of his sons as king, they didn't even bother to go bring David in. Well, it can't be him. So let's go through the seven that's in the house because number eight, it, it, it can't be him. Or number seven, how many was it? Seven? Eight, seven brothers. Acts tells us that, um, well, well, the Bible says even though he may have had uh, some complexities at time and different from his brothers, God loved him. We know that God loved him and he loved God. Amen. God loved him and he loved God. Acts 13 and 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Raised up unto them David to be their king. Started when he was young, anointed him when he was a lad. He grew into being the king. But he was able to grow into it because he loved God the whole time. Right? To whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, of what? Man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all of my will. The qualities David possessed were honorable and got him promoted into the king's house at a very young age. King Saul desired to have David come around him because of his character and skill. He was so young that Saul kept forgetting who he was. Saul wanted him to come in and play, but it seemed like every other chapter, okay, now who is this guy? Who is his father? <laughs> but he was so young, but he was talented and gifted, and he was able to provide the king what he needed. First Samuel tells us, and David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his what? Armor bearer. David wasn't just a man after God's heart in the spiritual sense. But in the natural sense as well. His character made him the candidate that God needed to eventually rule over his people and defeat one of the greatest enemies of his people, Goliath. Amen. Bible has Goliath standing pretty tall, around nine to 12 feet tall, somewhere in the vicinity of that. Him and his Nephilim brothers, he had five, uh, four other brothers, and they were all giants. 
1 Samuel 17 tells us, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines. Steins, Steins. How do you say it? Steins? Uh, I don't think it's Steins. I think it's Steins. Is it Steins? Black folks say Steins. White people say Steins. We're going to go with the white people on this one. And they went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. This coat of mail that he had was made of round brass disc that weighed 5,000 shekels, about 128 pounds. Yes, and these discs all fit together to form scales like a fish. Why does he wear fish scales? Because he worshiped who? Dagon, right? So he worshiped Dagon so he would decorate himself in like the scale. So these round symbols, kind of like symbols on drums. He made, they made him a whole coat of mail out of that. And the weight was about 120 pounds, something like that. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs so his legs was covered in brass and a target of brass between his shoulders so he was decked out I'm trying to figure out you that big what you scared of hurting you but and then the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam now this is incredible because his his spear was a two by four that's a weaver's beam so a weaver's beam y'all ever seen a loom well, they make clothes, you know, and it's these wood beams. They're, they're two by fours on a, and they put the wool on there and they move to make the wool. That's a weaver's beam, the two by four. That's his spear. That's how big he was. <laughs> you get your hand around a two by four? That's huge. So, he, the, so that was his spear. That was the shaft. And then the head weighed 15 to 20 pounds, the head of the spear. Yeah, I mean, that's a big dude. I couldn't carry it. I'd be dragging stuff. I mean, that's a big dude. And one bearing a shield went before him. So stuff was so heavy, he had to have a dude just to carry the shield. He the shield carrier. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, why are ye come out to set your battle array? Am I not a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. The Bible said this dude came out every day, twice a day for 40 days. Yeah. Now, Saul was tall. The Bible said he was a foot taller than everybody else in, in Israel. Right? So Saul is talking. Why ain't Saul fighting? Because the Spirit of the Lord left Saul. You don't think Saul know? <laughs> That's why he's bringing David in. He know if he go out there, he going to get that two by four. So Saul ain't messing with it. The Bible said they were all scared of this guy. And he would come out twice a day for 40 days threatening them. And nobody did anything. David was a master marksman, the Bible tells us, with his shepherd sling. So David, just he just talented. He could play music, and boy, with his slingshot, he was like the other shepherds. This is a normal thing for shepherds to use a shepherd's sling. We know he gathered five stones just in case Goliath's four brothers showed up. But these five stones were not just physical stones. But he also possessed five good character traits that the Bible named as well that enabled him to confidently defeat any giant that came his way. In order to defeat giants, you have to have the right character. Amen. You will never defeat something that you keep doing. You got to muster up the character to defeat it. Your character has to be better. Can I keep preaching? 
First Samuel tells us that he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in his shepherd bag, which he had, even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistines. So the Bible tells us that Saul even tried to put his armor on David. And David said, man, I ain't practiced in this, so I can't wear this. And that was probably mostly true. But the other side of the story was, had he been victorious wearing Saul's equipment, Saul would have got the credit. That's the only reason Saul offered it to him. Yeah, Saul was this jivest, one of the jivest dudes in the Bible, definitely. But this sling was all he needed because this is where he spent all his time. This is where he, this is what, hey. He spent all his time with the sheep, so he's used to using this sling. I got a video to show you kind of how this sling works. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's effective, Jay Bryant. Um, you see how far away he is? Okay. Somebody like, I need to get me one of those. You need to hit yourself. Knock yourself out. <laughs> Be all tangled up in it. <laughs> that takes years of practice. Y'all be like me with the shake, shake. Brother. <laughs> Ask me where those are. I gave up. Okay. <laughs> First Samuel 16 and 8 outlines the character that David had. Now, this was after the evil spirit was coming on Saul, and Saul said, hey, I need somebody to come and play some music to chase off this evil spirit. I remember God showed me this when I first started the truth, the truth behind hip-hop about playing spirits out, playing spirits in. This was Saul, Saul knew and understood that the right music, you could play a spirit out calm that down and the wrong music if it's the opposite of that you can definitely bring a hindering spirit amen I find in my preaching and travels and everything I find out that folks have evil spirits in their lives that won't let them get good jobs won't let them get married won't let them have children all these things because of the music they listen to sometimes it's the music you used to listen to well, this really became real to me. Can I go back a little bit? Okay, this don't have nothing to do with it. Well, yeah, I guess it does. Well, this really became real to me as I had to speak in uh, Tahoma, Kansas. Topeka, what did I say, Tahoma? Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Kansas is considered the center of the United States. I had to speak there and do the truth behind hip hop. You know, I didn't even understand geographics. I didn't understand principalities and those kind of things as I was just starting out. So I didn't know how this stuff worked. But in Topeka, Kansas, when I got there, I went to the church to speak. I don't even remember who I traveled with. Was it you? I don't, I don't know. But I was with somebody. But we traveled there, went there to do the truth behind hip hop. I did the truth behind hip hop. Dude comes up after I finishes the message. He said, I am Africa Bambada's right hand man. He said when he got back from Africa and studied the Zulu and all that stuff, me and him got together. And he wanted to get with me, he said, because I make records. I said, oh, okay, so you're an artist or something? He said, no, I'm not an artist, he said, but I make records with frequencies. And I name my records based on what these frequencies do. So he had a record for getting a job. If you want to get a job, you play this record and the frequencies will enable you to have something happen to you to where you can get a job. If you want a divorce, if you want to run your wife off, if you want to get a wife, if you want to get a bunch of women, whatever. He had records for all of that. Literally. I saw it. Like, he said, I got them all, but I want out of this. He said, I want out of this. Your message is the truth. I want to be free. He said, but I got all my stuff. 
You say, go get it. They went out there and started bringing crates and crates, Elder. Crates and crates. Filled the stage up with big crates of records. You was with me? Okay, my baby was with me. Just crates, 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 records. Fill the stage up. Crates, crates. Yeah. I had never seen anything like it. He had a record for everything. You go on the, in the surgery, you play this record, and these frequencies will help you. What it was was the frequencies was bringing spirits. And would bring whatever spirit it was that responded to that frequency in whatever realm, bring it in, and that spirit will come. It's kind of like burning sage. Yeah, you may be doing one thing, but there's also another thing happening. You know, you're opening yourself up. Basically, when you burn sage, you're cleansing the atmosphere, but you're not cleansing it with smoke. Smoke don't cleanse. No, you're bringing a spirit that's greater than all the rest of the stuff in there. That spirit can cleanse it all to make room for himself. Y'all see what I'm saying? So this is what this dude's records did. He had all these records, thousands of them. They brought them all in with crates. We prayed for them, cast demons out of everything. Brother got delivered everything. We left. Over that morning, I think we had to go and um, go to breakfast or something. And I asked the pastor, I said, hey, man, I, said, I just think we need to go back to the church man because I kind of want to look at those records he said man somebody broke in the church and got all those records and that's when I knew I said okay we dealing with something here and one of the things that the guy told me he said the reason I'm in Topeka he said because I'm Brooklyn but he said, I'm in Topeka because that's the center of the United States. So he said, I can play this music. I can go up in the mountains and play it. And it'll reverb all over the United States because this is the center. All true. That all happened. Yeah. So that's when this became, you know, real to me. How the spiritual side of things actually worked. So in order to challenge these things, we got to make sure we allow God to develop our character. You know, when you come to a church like this, you may, be, you may feel weird about the way you are. Or you may feel uncomfortable because, you know, I got this, I'm kind of this way, man, because I didn't have the best upbringing. Man, I didn't have the best this or that. So, I mean, But that's why we come here. We come here to sharpen each other so that we can all work on our character and be better have a better character because God needs our character to help us defeat our giants. Amen. You're not a giant killer if you don't have the right character. David as a lad, Saul said, hey man, I need somebody to come and play. I need somebody and I bet he needed someone that was a man after God's own heart. He needed someone that was clean, that was pure, that had the right lifestyle to counteract what he was going through when he played music. That's why music is so important when it comes to worship and different things. And it's so dangerous when it comes to anti-God stuff. Amen. You think you just turn to flipping on the radio and listening to Bobby Womack? I just like the old school stuff. They was crazy too. And gay. All them old dudes was gay. I met a lot of them. I know a lot of them. I know a pastor used to travel with all of them. He told me they're all a bunch of gays. All sweaty in their videos. And, you know, men just don't be wearing stuff with their chest out and all that. That's not, that's not straight. That's not straight. Men don't just show their bodies like that. Amen. That's lewdness. Tight and satin and sequins. Rick James wore more makeup. He looked like he could have been a Maybelline model. Yeah. But he needed somebody that could play the right frequencies. Chase off the evil spirit. So it's, this dude have to be right. So a guy, one of his servants said... The Bible says, uh, well, let me read it. First Samuel 16, 18. Then the, one of the servants said, behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the, Be the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, meaning he's skilled, a mighty, valiant man, meaning he's courageous, 
and a man of war, meaning he's a fighter, and prudent in matters, and a calmly good-looking person, and the Lord is with him, which means God is with him. Saul says, get him. That's who I need. I need this guy. He's the opposite of me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, but I'm not. He's all the things I'm not. So go get him. This is how you fight. Look at somebody and say, this is how you kill your giants. This is how you kill your giants. You got to have these five things. These are the five things I just read. First, you got to be skilled. Man, you're not going to make any money without skill. Amen. Women, you ain't going to make no money and you're going to mess your home up if you don't have skill. You need to learn how to do home stuff. Look, ain't nobody, see. Amen. You need to. You got to keep a clean house. You know, clean house keep folks happy. Folks get unhappy and unsettled when the house ain't clean. Folks just walk around, mm, what you doing? What you looking at when the house ain't clean? Amen. Got to learn how to cook. Let me go over here to some old-fashioned women. See, these young women like, cook? That's what restaurants are for. No, it's not. You better learn how to cook. Skill! You better have some skill. Amen. Now, you ain't got to be Anne Marie, but you got to have some skill. Yeah, in order to prosper in whatever you do, you must be what? Skill. This comes from consistency and dedication to learn and improve. There are no musicians that become skillful without practicing consistently. Nobody's good because the anointing came upon them. The anointing, the anointing comes upon them when they're good. Amen. Yep. I hate when people get that testimony. I couldn't play at all. And I walked up to the keyboard and the power of God came on me. You're lying. They're lying. I got, I, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and this stuff I can't play. And I've been playing for years. <laughs> Amen. Get me some of that. I'm, I'm like Simon the Sorcerer. How much that cost? <laughs> Amen. No, you got to practice consistently. And this goes with any profession. Look at somebody and say, don't give up. Yeah, you might not be good at it now, but you're going to get good at it. Skilled at it. Do you know that's a huge boost to your self-esteem when you're good at something? When you're confident that you can do something, it makes you feel good about yourself yeah. yeah so you need skill this young man had skill if you want to be skilled you have to put the time in in order for David to even have the confidence and faith to believe he could defeat Goliath he had to first defeat the bear and the lion We must be passionate enough about our skills to give God's power something to work through. Amen. A person that doesn't have the passion cannot be passionate. Amen. 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 Proverbs 22 and 29. Seeth thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. So if you're diligent, in your business, you're going to stand before kings. Amen. Amen. And you can't just talk that you are. You have to be. Amen. This ain't the kind of message some people wanted to hear this morning, but I'm, I'm just letting, uh, allowing God to work on all of us. Amen. Amen. 
Hone in on your skill. Get good at something. Look at somebody and say, get good at something. And let that be your thing. Courageous. If you want to be a giant killer, you got to have courage. Eddie Rickenbacker said this, powerful. Courage is doing what you're afraid to do. There can be no courage unless you're scared. That's deep. Yeah, that's what you, you don't need courage if you ain't scared to do it. Got to have courage to overcome fear. A person that is not afraid to step out on faith and do what seems difficult or even impossible has courage. You got to step out on faith. Amen. Amen. When you do, you know how many, how many married folks we got in here? How many of you had to step out on faith to get married? How many of you knew the future when you got married? You knew the future. Somebody like, if I did. <laughs> Just move on, pastor. Just move on. God ain't going to show you everything. But you didn't know. You had to step out on faith. You had to step out on, you jumped off the cliff with that person. You jumped off the cliff with Pat and said, you didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> Thanks for that illustration. I hope the camera's captured. <laughs> but you did. You stepped out on faith. Look, you got beautiful children there. Beautiful. Look at beautiful Izzy and Jerry. <laughs> Savannah, just, I mean, you got a, a beautiful family because you took a chance. You took a chance. That went to that barbershop. You weren't trying to get your hair cut. Was that the barbershop? Your hair probably was like that. Uh, yes, I need a, I need a haircut. <laughs> oh, but you got beauty. Hey, Amen. You, when you do that, you have to step out on faith. That's a faith move. You got to say, this is the one. Let's go. Because if you think about it too long, it's not going to be the one. We can find a reason with anybody. I don't like the way she sneaks. I mean, she got an ugly laugh. I mean, what? Yeah, you just start looking for stuff if you don't take the leap of faith. So, that's courage. You got to have courage to pick a mate. Start a life with somebody. I know I'm preaching. Courage is not the absence of being afraid. It means that you are not afraid of being frightened. Yeah, I'm not afraid of being afraid. Amen. Amen. Yeah. If you riding through the hood and you know. I was at this place the other day, you know, and, you know, had one of my kind of nice cars. I was pulled up, you know, and looked a little unsavory. I didn't think nothing of it. Went in, you know, came out. Two hood dudes looked like Quavo and Offset. And they... They were leaning up against my car like this. Smoking weed. Just smoking. So I walked out. I was like. It's a little different than when I'm not in ABC. You know, I ain't, ain't no security with me. So I have to behave a little differently. So I walked up. And, you know, I was frightened. Yeah, I was frightened. A little afraid. But then I started thinking about the car payments. I said, you know what? That's my car. So I walked up, you know, you know, I was ready. I mean, you know, if it goes there. But I walked up and a dude looked, he's like, oh man, this yours. And of course he used, he called it other stuff I can't say in church. This, this it? I said, I said, I said, 
yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, man, that's my car. Well, no, what I did, I chirped it. You know how you make the lights flash? So I walked up and I chirped it. Then they saw me, oh man, this is it. We don't mean no disrespect. Get off his car, get off his car. We don't need no disrespect, man. We just want you to know this is the baddest car in the world. You know, so I'm thinking then, now I hope they don't ask me for a ride. So I'm trying to downplay it. It's all right. But they backed off the car. You know, little young dudes, they didn't mean no harm. There ain't nothing finna go down, but that's my car. So, you know, so yeah, my heart, you know how you get that heart, and you, do, you know, because it might be about to go down. You never know. <laughs> but I trust the Spirit of the Lord, and that's always the first thing I do. I say, Lord, hey, God, you know I don't want no trouble, Lord. I got a family at home. I don't need no smoke. But you can't be scared and frightened. Amen. No, I didn't witness to her. I got in my car and I got out of there. Yeah, you may have. I'll give you the address. You go back, check on it. It wasn't, that just wasn't what I got from the Lord. God told me, get in your car and get out of there. And that's what I did. Amen. For some folks just so saved, you didn't speak a word. No. Yeah, I'm going to reach them and they high. <laughs> Goliath's appearance may have been frightening. It had to be. If this dude is that tall, wearing all that stuff, so you know his voice was deep. He was growling at him. He was a monster. So you know he didn't look like the bear and the lion that, <coughs> that, that David was used to. So his appearance may have been frightening, but David was not afraid because he was skilled and he knew he could do what no one else believed he could do with God's help. That's the difference. God's help. I thank God when I saw those dudes, there was no doubt in my mind that that was not my end. I knew that wasn't my end. I knew it. There was something God settled in my heart when I saw him to let me know that this is not going there. You see what I'm saying? But that's because of my relationship with the Lord. My courage wasn't based on me and my gat. Because I'm sure they had some too. And it was more them. My courage was based on God's plan for me. His plan for me that night wasn't for me to expire. And I felt it in my spirit. Amen. Amen. Goliath's appearance may have been frightening, but David was not afraid because of his skill. This pleased God. God was pleased because David wasn't afraid to the point that he wasn't going to challenge him. The closer we are to God, the braver we become when engaging our giants. Amen. Your willpower is not going to do it. You got to have the spirit of the Lord. You will fail every time with your willpower. You can say, I'm not going to ever. Oh, oh, I'm not. I'm done. Until the next time. It's going to take the spirit of the Lord to kill certain giants. Amen. Deuteronomy 31 and 6 says, be strong and of good what? Courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. When you know God, you're braver. Oh, you ain't gonna, how you gonna fight a giant and you're not a fighter? You can't be a quitter. Men, women, everybody in here, children, you, you can't be a quitter. 
When you start something, you finish it. Amen. Amen. You start a marriage, you finish it. You start a courtship, you go on and finish it. Amen. Don't let it go too long. You're going to have reasons to get out of it. I know, man, I know. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. You got to be a fighter. That's the only way you're going to kill giants. You fall off the horse, get back on it. Amen. You get weak, get strong again. Yeah, if you got weak, that implies that you were once stronger than that. Because you got weak. Get back. Look at somebody say, get back strong. That's a fighter. Get back strong. Quit, quit, quitting. Can't be no quit in you. Man, when I want to quit, Jay, I can't. When I feel like quitting, I just wait till I feel like not quitting. When I feel like quitting, I don't quit. I just wait till I feel like not quitting. It's going to come around. Amen. Might have to take a break, but I'm going to get back on it. A person that will not fight against their flesh and feelings has already lost. Let me go over here. They, 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 uh. A person that will not fight against their flesh and feelings has already lost. So if you don't fight against what's against you, you've already lost. Your flesh is against you. Your feelings are against you. You know your feelings are going to get you in trouble? Yeah. So, a person that will not fight has already lost. We must be able to challenge the giants in our lives and be willing to do whatever it takes. Look at somebody and say whatever. whatever. Whatever it takes to defeat them. We have to see ourselves victorious in order to get the victory. Right. Got to first see it. Yeah. We have to know that God gave us the power to overcome the world. So we must be willing to fight until we see the giants fall. My giants ain't falling. Are you done fight? Anyone can physically fight, but can you emotionally and mentally fight to overcome doubt, fear, shame, regret, abandonment, and sin? Can you emotionally and mentally fight your feelings? That's why I hate that phrase, I'm in my feelings. Why are you in your feelings? Yes, come out of that. Come out of your feelings. Yeah. And I just feel, quit feeling. And do what you're supposed to do. Anybody can physically fight, but can you emotionally and mentally stand up to your giant? But Pastor, what happened to me was so hard. Welcome to the human race, bruh. Welcome. We all have to fight. Even when he fell, oh, David was a fighter that never gave up on anything. He never stopped fighting. Even when he fell hard, he got up. And got back to being a man after God's own heart. This is why he was always victorious when he fought. He was always victorious because he kept fighting. Amen. You know, the one time David got in all the rucus was the time he didn't go with the rest of them to fight. He stayed home. Normally, oh, it's a battle. He's in the front. This time, he stayed at the house, looking at his window. <laughs> Psalms 144 and 1. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to do what? Fight. 
Prudence. I preach about this all the time. Man, this is considering your future. Being prudent, prudent in matters. That means that your future, you consider that when making decisions. You know how much dumb stuff you will avoid if you consider the future? Where is this going? Can this happen? Will this work out for me? Is this the best way to do this? If the answer is no, what are you doing? Is this going to get me in trouble? Has it gotten people in trouble before? Is this a good idea? One of the things that God loved most about David was his prudence. Are y'all enjoying this message? I am. This is why God kept referring to him well after his death as the example for all the kings of Israel and Judah. Saul sought after the approval of people and the spoils of the enemy. Saul was concerned about what people thought about him. David was concerned about what God thought about him. Big difference. Saul sought after that. He even killed God's priest and tried to do the job of the high priest. He was a mess and never considered the people or the future of God's kingdom. So Saul's actions, he never considered the future. Saul didn't even consider, man, Maybe one day they're writing down everything we're doing <laughs> and people go read about it. <laughs> I would have been that prudent. Maybe, <laughs> maybe there'll be more kings after me and I'm going to be the worst example. That's why he hated David so much because David was already, the Bible said that David was better than him. That's what Samuel said. When he went to Saul, he said, God has Strip the kingdom from you and giving it to somebody that's better than you. Prudence would have made me be better then. Oh Lord, I'm, don't just say I'm sorry. Go be better. Saul got worse. He got worse. That's how I know the Spirit of the Lord will never leave me because I'll be snotting and I'll change everything. Brother, I'll change everything. What? Something needs to be changed, God? No. Take not your spirit away from me. Ain't nothing worth it. Amen. Amen. Let's see. That's okay. No, but that was David's attitude. I'm sorry. No, well, it was, you know, it was the people that did that. And, you know, they just, just, but if you pray for me right now, Samuel, I believe that we can come to, no, I'm not, no, that's not my posture. <laughs> this is God we're talking about. Amen. You don't know how to cry to God? I know, I know how to cry. He was a mess and never considered the people or the future of God's kingdom. David, on the other hand, kept God God. This is how we must be. We cannot just talk the talk, but we must keep God's plan as what? Our plan. His plan is for us to defeat the giants and fulfill his plan in the earth. Prudence keeps us fighting against those emotions and feelings that come to alter our future. So we can fulfill God's purpose for our lives. I have so many people tell me, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my husband. Why? Because I just feel. You going to leave because of feelings? You don't leave because of feelings because feelings do what? Change. Change. You didn't feel like this when you married him. Ooh, he the best ever. Ooh. When he got your number. It's <laughs> a whole different... <laughs> Now, all of a sudden, you don't feel. Man, you better, feel, you better work on those feelings. Amen? And consider your future. You walk away from him, where are you going? <laughs> Clearance shelf. That's where you going. Mark down. The red line through you. The, the, the orange sticker. You got to sit with the brown meat. 
meat that done browned over. <laughs> you better stay there. You better, boy, you got somebody, you better stay with them. Look at somebody and say, you better stay with them. Uh, yes, look at somebody in here. Say, you better stay with them. You, you better, all right. All right, it ain't, ain't, the grass ain't greener on the other side. It's Texas. There ain't much green grass around here. Most grass is burnt over. Work it out. Work it out. Oh, I'm ministering to somebody. Work it out. Work it out, man. Get tough on everybody. Amen. You ain't going to be in love all the time. Sometimes you're not even going to be in like. But you wait for those times to come back around and they will. You pray for them and then you be looking at them and man, some old feelings come back. You see a, a smile or an eye glimmer or something to remind you of something. You be like. <laughs> then you write back. Am I telling the truth, folks that have been married for a minute? Am I telling the truth? You can be mad for weeks. Just uh, what I do this for. Well, you're 30 years in. I mean, you might as well. Uh, uh, and then one day you're just like, hmm. Yeah. It's going to be all right. Prudence. But it'll keep you fighting off emotions that are stupid. So you can fulfill God's purpose for your life. Proverbs 14 and 15. The simple, the stupid believes everything. Everything they see on the internet. Stupid. You can leave him. You better leave a dude like that. You better leave her. She ain't no good on the internet. And they don't have nobody but the internet. They taking a phone to bed. You land with a laptop under the sheet. You and a laptop wrapped up together. Better get on somewhere. VR glasses. You at VR. You just virtual reality. Oh, you the lawnmower man. <laughs> you simple, you stupid, and you believe everything. But the prudent, those that consider their future, they give thoughts to their steps. The steps I'm making, I'm thinking them through. Because I'm trying to get somewhere. Oh, this is the important one. God was with David. The Bible said, this is the best, this is the best one, uh, the, his greatest character um, attribute. The fact that God was with him. When David was anointed by Samuel, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and never left him. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and never left him. You know why it never left him? Because he didn't want it to leave him. Oh, he didn't want the spirit of the Lord to leave him. Did he do everything right? No way. But he didn't ever want the spirit of the Lord to leave him. He knew how to call on God. He spent a whole book of the Bible doing it. When David was anointed by Samuel, the spirit of the Lord came upon him and never left him. This same spirit gave him power to defeat wild animals, his enemies, and his own failures. David failed numerous times, but God never gave up on him and never took his spirit from him because of his heart. If he has a heart for God, why take your spirit from him? He took his spirit from Saul because Saul did not have. A heart for God. David wasn't just good looking on the outside, but his heart was for God. In order to be victorious over giants in your life, you must keep a heart for God's plan. When God is with you, it doesn't matter what comes against you. Amen. First Samuel 16 and 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren in front of all the other brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. From that day forward. 
Summary. We all have giants in our lives that we must defeat. Amen. Amen. Some are physical. People. Some are mental. And most are emotional. Given the times we're living in. Most of us were raised in some kind of deficit. You were raised in some kind of trauma. You were raised single parent or something like that. You know, just not the ideal situation. So, most of your giants are emotional. Trauma, pain, agony, hurt, anger, resentment, malice, etc. Are some of the largest giants in our lives today. They all come to thwart the plan of God in our lives and make our personal feelings greater than our spiritual reasoning. They must be defeated so that God's plan can supersede our fears. Amen. Amen. The good news is that the character traits that David possess are the same ones that we all need to overcome our mental and emotional giants. Just as David was equipped naturally and spiritually to fight, we must be equipped as well. We must pray for these character traits in our lives so that we can fulfill his plan for us no matter what we have been through. David was considered by others inferior, just a kid, and incapable of defeating his giants. But because he possessed the character needed to win, he defeated one of the greatest enemies of God. So it doesn't really matter what people think of you. Look at somebody and say, it don't really matter. No matter what people think of you, it doesn't really matter. Or the mistakes you may have made along the way, they don't matter either. If you allow God to create the right things in you, you can defeat any giants that are in your way and fulfill God's plan for your life. Amen. Amen. I hope this ministered to you because... I read this message over and over and over because it was blessing me. It was blessing me. 1 Samuel 17 and 42 tells us, and when the Philistine looked about, speaking of Goliath, and saw David, he, he was just like, are you kidding? He disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance, look cute, red boy. Probably freckle face. He's ready. <laughs> so the giant looked at him and said, are y'all kidding? And the Philistine said, man, am I a dog that you coming to me with sticks? You got a little strap and a stick and a, what, what you plan on doing? Do you see me? This weaver's beam. <laughs> Staff is wider than your body. You really going to come do this? And the Bible said the Philistine cursed David by his gods, by the power of Dagon. You going to be dead. And the Philistine, said, the Philistine said to David, come to me and I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, ooh, I love this. David said, man, you coming to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast defied. So you ain't messing with me. You're messing with God. You defied the God of Israel? It's like David just got taller and taller as he was talking. Wait a minute. What? Who are you? He said, this day, today, like in a minute, <laughs> will the Lord deliver thee into my hand. 
will smite thee and then I'm going to take your head from you. <laughs> you know God and the host was probably in the heavenly, they were all probably standing up like, <laughs> ooh, ooh, you heard that? Ooh, Jesus. Listen, ooh, we got a real one here. Oh my goodness, I know heaven was going crazy. He said, I'm going to take your head. <laughs> and then I'm going to give your carcass, your old big rotten body, and all the Philistines' bodies to the fowls of the air. Like you said you're going to do to me, I'm going to do it, not just with you, all of y'all. All of the Philistines, everybody here, that's not us. I'm going to give all y'all's carcasses to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that the whole earth may know that there is a what? God in Israel. David could have really got ugly and said, your God is somewhere with his hands cut off laying on the floor in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, I heard about that story. Even your statue can't stand in front of my God. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saves, but not with sword or spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass the Philistine got mad. Goliath got mad and arose and came and drew near. You know he can't move fast. He drew near to meet David, but David was little, so the Bible said he hasted, took off running to him. Wait a minute. David took off running toward him like, what, you coming to me? I'm coming to you. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. How did he fall? He fell just like the God he was dressed as, Dagon. Same spirit, spirit that was in the Ark of the Covenant was in David. And he fell the same way, but this time it was for real. A real life giant fell. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote him and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Bible says he did it with the sling. But now I got to keep my promise. I promised you that I was going to take your head. But I don't have a sword, so guess I'll use yours. <laughs> David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut his head off. Cut his head off. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, everybody fled. And you know, once they went running, Israel ran after him. And I mean, once you get folks running, you got to get the cutting dicing and slicing the power of God and that's what your giant is your giant is trying to defy trying to defy the purpose God has for you you got to treat it just like Goliath amen everyone stand to your feet Stuff in your life trying to stop God's plan for you. God want to do something in your life. He wants your family to be better than the family you grew up in. He wants your marriage to be better than the marriage you grew up under. He wants your life to be better. These giants coming to defy it, stop it, hinder it, slow it down. 
And you got to see it just like David saw Goliath. Don't wait for it to run at you. You run at it. We're going to pray. I want to pray just to empower you to handle these things in your life so you can kill these giants dead. Not just knock them out. He could have just knocked Goliath out and left him there. No, he finished the job. I got to kill this thing because this thing is going to get back up and come back. So I have to make sure I kill it. And that's what you have to do. So your life God's plan and his purpose can operate through your life unhindered, unhindered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, this was a good message, boy. I feel the anointing of God at the end. <laughs> Fighting these giants, man. Hey, man. Come on up. Come back that way if you need to go that way. Whoever, we got room for you. That's why we expanded this building. We got room. Amen. You got to be a giant killer. You got to be a giant killer. Giants go nowhere if you don't kill them. You got to be a giant killer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, you struggle with it your whole life. That's what a giant is. It's as old as you are. That's when the devil think he got legal right to stuff. When he been around. It's been around longer than, oh man. Far as you can remember, you've been dealing with this. That's a giant. Goliath didn't get that tall overnight. It took time. He antagonized them for 40 days. Twice a day. 80 times they had to hear this giant challenge them. Do you know that children had to see them afraid of him? So he had every generation afraid. But David said, nah, man, you're not defying us. You're defying God. So we got to handle this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone bow your heads. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for this message. Thank you for your truth, the truth in your word, the richness of your biblical accounts. We thank you. Thank you, Father God, for this story of this man that you considered the greatest king in, of Israel. We thank you, Lord, for this story because you showed us his imperfections. You showed us his failures. You showed us when he erred, but then you showed us his character, why you loved him, why he loved you, why he wasn't afraid, why he stayed strong, why he was skilled, why he would continue to fight. You showed us every aspect of this young man until he became old and died. You, you showed us everything. And we thank you for showing us that because we can see ourselves in this. We can see our failures. We can see our error. We can see our mistakes. God, we can see our, even our unsorted upbringing and, and dysfunction and trauma and all of these different things. We can see it, but then we can also see the character that you're building in us. We can see how you brought us to a place where these things can be worked on. How you bring us here so we can, Father God, work on the character and be better in these areas. So Father, we have hope because of these stories. And we thank you, God, for messages that come like this. We thank you, Lord, for sharing information like this. So we know we can be better if we allow you to make us better. So right now we yield. Come on, lift your hands up. We just yield to you. We yield to your plan. We yield to your will. We yield to your way. We want to be better. Make us better, God. Make us better, Lord. Make us better. Make us better so that we can fulfill your plan in our lives. And every giant in our life, God, anoint us and give us the power to defeat. In the name of Je every Goliath, every spirit, 
that rises up to defy your plan and your purpose for us. Father God, we ask for strength to overcome it, to fight it and kill it in the name of Jesus. Empower us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us the power, every bear, every lion, every giant. Give us the power and we'll overcome it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Come on and hug somebody and say, go kill them giants. Every one of them. Hallelujah. Remember, David was prepared for five of them. He was ready for all five of the Goliath family. I don't know what their last name was, but he was prepared for all of them. You better be prepared. Go and slay those giants. Hallelujah. David, just a small dude, man. Little young, young buck. He had some inferiority kind of issues too, you know, because Bible tells us that his dad had him running food to his brothers. He's running food to him when he was getting ready to fight Fred. He's, he ran some food to him and then he was like, who is this giant out here talking all this noise? And his oldest brother Elijah said, what did you come here for? What are you doing here? And David said, what did I do now? So that tells you right there that he was picked on. What did I do? What did I do this time? 